Hi, and welcome to Facebook Live today. I'm Stephanie Stapleton, an editor here at KHN. And I'm Diane Weber, another editor here at KHN. And we're talking about an often an overlooked part of the healthcare cost continuum. It's the expense of air ambulances. Diane has been coordinating our recent coverage. We have links to those stories on our Facebook page. Also, if you have a question or a comment, please post it there too. Now, Diane, can we get started with just a quick exp explanation of what we're talking about? Sure. Um, so air ambulances um, are what you might need if you are um, if you're injured in a remote place or um, if you have a very serious health problem and you're at a hospital that doesn't have the sort of specialty care that you need to handle it. And if your doctors decide, you know, we need to get you from point A to point B very quickly, you might need uh, an air ambulance, which is a helicopter staffed with medical professionals. Um, and they often come with very high bills. Okay. Now, for me, it was interesting. But before I read these stories, I always assumed that those medical helicopters were associated with the hospitals that they serve, but that's not necessarily the case, right? It's not necessarily the case. Uh, and the industry may have started that way, but that's sort of not where we are now. Um, private equity has come into the industry, and they've bought up um, air ambulances around the country. And uh, so mostly they are for-profit businesses now. Okay. independent of the hospitals that. And and what started the process? What got you and the team of reporters that you've been working with to look at this issue? Right. Uh, we are, this was part of our Kaiser Health News and NPR is uh, doing a year-long sort of crowdsourced investigation called the Bill of the Month, um, where we're asking people around the country to send us their medical bills that seem uh, interesting or very high or just kind of strange, um, and there are a lot of them. Uh, we've had over a thousand people uh, send us bills, um, and we noticed that we had uh, more than a dozen bills about air ambulances. So we thought, this is a story we probably want to focus on. Um, and I worked with uh, Allison Kojak at NPR. She did uh, the story for us. And uh, Jackie Fortier at State Impact Oklahoma. She did a great story about the sort of uh, politics and policy around this industry. Okay. What were the specifics of the case that you all ended up focusing on for the Bill of the Month story? Sure. Uh, in September, we focused on um, a story sent to us by uh, Dr. Naveed Khan. Uh, he's a young man, a 35-year-old um, radiologist. He lives in the suburbs of Dallas. Um, and he's got a beautiful family, three small children. Um, and he was uh, going out sort of guy's weekend uh, into the country. Um, and he was riding on an ATV. Uh, all-terrain vehicle. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's right. Uh, for the first time. Um, and so it was this four-wheeler, and he didn't quite, um, the balance got off on it, and he ended up toppling over, and it fell on his left arm. And it was a really serious injury. Even though he was a doctor, he didn't at first understand how bad it was. Um, but uh, he was, they called 911. They went by ground to uh, the nearest hospital. And at that hospital, they said, uh, oh, hey, we can't handle this here. You need to go on an air ambulance. And um, you know, he's a medical professional. We've actually gotten a lot of bill of the month uh, sent to us from people who are doctors or nurses and clinicians. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, I think that's interesting. Um, but even as a medical, so as a medical professional, he said, well, is this in my network? How much is this going to cost me? And the the doctors there said, you know, hey, you don't actually have time to be asking these questions. Um, we're trying to save your arm. You need to get in this helicopter. And so he did, and he was taken to a level one trauma center, and he ended up being there for three weeks. He had multiple surgeries, uh, and they weren't, in the end, able to save his arm. Um, but... Uh, Three days into that hospital stay, he got a call from the air ambulance company saying, this is going to be over $50,000. How are you going to pay for it? Now, 
That's kind of a startling <laughs> number, but you said you got a lot of uh, submissions about these air ambulances. And what kind? What was the range of those submissions? Where does this one fall? Sure. I think the cheapest one was about $28,000. Um, the most expensive one was $98,000. Um, and many of them were in the forty dollars to $50,000 range. So this one was pretty typical for what we got. And after we did Dr. Khan's story, we got another dozen uh, mm -hmm. uh, submissions on air ambulances. So um, it, it's, a, it's a lot of money. Um, one of the people who sent a bill, a woman from California, said um, she, you know, she had a broken back and she can't work. And she's just wondering how they came to the $98,000 uh, figure. You know, she said, for $98,000, my husband could become a pilot. You know, <laughs> we could buy a plane. Like, where is this money going? Well, that leads to the next question. How uh, how much do these helicopter rides actually cost? I mean, are there any estimates or ballpark figures for that? Yeah, uh, that came up in Allison's reporting. It was really, she found a, um, a report that the industry itself uh, commissioned, and it came out with the, the average cost per flight is about $11,000. Um, and, you know, all of our bills are some multiple of eleven thousand dollars that we got. Um, so, but the industry's uh, argument is um, that Medicare pays about six thousand dollars for per flight. Medicaid pays even less, and then they have some uh, patients who are uninsured and uh, pay nothing. So uh, they set their prices for uh, private pay patients, patients with private insurance, and at these higher rates to kind of make up the difference that they're not getting from the public insurance. But do the these insurance companies, you know, for the people that have coverage, do they end up paying those rates? I mean, what happened to Dr. Khan? Um, they, so Dr. Khan's insurer at first said, no, we're not going to pay this at all. Um, and he, and again, he's a savvy health consumer. <laughs> um, he kind of looked in the fine print of his policy, and it said uh, that they were responsible if if uh, a loss of limb was threatened. And making that argument, his insurer paid uh, eleven thousand dollars for the flight, but the company is still balance billing him forty four thousand dollars. And um, one of the issues here is that. Um, these air ambulance companies are regulated by the Federal Aviation Administration, um, and they cannot be regulated by states. So most insurance companies are regulated by states, and they say, you have to have an adequate network, you have to have all this stuff. Um, you, you, a lot of states are saying you can't surprise bill people like this. Um, the air ambulance companies are not subject to those state regulations. Okay. We're going to, I'm going to get back to that, but I see we have a question from one of our followers, one of our Facebook followers. Um, Susan writes to us, she wants to know what your view is, Diane, on subscription or membership type medical air transport services. Right. That's a great question because um, sort of a, it's something that a lot of these companies are doing um, as a marketing to, in their communities, they're saying, okay, these bills can be, you know, catastrophic for a family, mm -hmm. or send you into bankruptcy. Um, so what we would, what we can offer is you pay us $100, $150 a month, um, and you will not be billed this way if you're ever, if you ever need the service. Um, it's a pretty good idea, uh, but there's sort of a buyer beware. Um, if you're in a rural area and you know um, that you could uh, potentially need this service, it might be a good idea, but the, the key question is to find out whether your area is served by two different air ambulance companies, because if it is, um, you know, when you need the service, when you're incapacitated, you might not be able to choose the company that you have been paying. So you could still be end up with one of these big bills from a different company. Right. So it, it's, uh, 
I'd say it's an interesting option, but you have to uh, be careful. Okay. Now, and also, I think just to be clear, you know, we're all very used to regular ground ambulances that go on the road. They charge bills too, right? I mean, they it's, do. It's <laughs> they do charge bills, and they. Um, we have had some stories about. Uh, balance billing or, or surprise billing in that industry as well. Um, but the difference is that uh, you, um, they, some ground ambulances have to be in a network. They are subject to state laws. Uh, the air ambulances are sort of, they're operating with less, a lot less regulation, essentially, and the bills are a lot bigger. Okay. Now, if you are just joining us, I'm Stephanie Stapleton, and this is Diane Weber, and we're talking about the high cost of air ambulances. If you have a comment or a question, please post it to our Facebook page. Now, back to the topic at hand. <laughs> um, how big of an industri industry excuse me, are we really talking about here? Um, well, it's a pretty big industry, and it has grown a lot in the past two decades. There are about 900 uh, air ambulance uh, uh, sites around the country, um, and it grew a lot um, after 2002 when Medicare raised the rate per flight that it would pay. So that kind of attracted private equity, and that brought more um, ambulances, air, more helicopters into the, the landscape. But so that's competition. Did that help? Or <laughs> um, usually competition helps. Uh, but in this case, uh, the industry says uh, it it has actually driven prices higher because uh, the number of people who need an air ambulance remains pretty stable year mm -hmm. to year, and um, and the helicopters have high fixed costs. You have to, you know, employ a pilot. Uh, you have to employ medical professionals. Uh, you have to buy a helicopter. You have to buy a helicopter. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so now those fixed costs are spread out over more helicopters. So it's a higher price per ride. Okay. Now, and also this is something that you have kind of touched on throughout our talk, but, you know, there is a different regulatory approach to medical air transport. So can you kind of go in depth on that now? Sure. Um, it's, um, it was interesting, you know, you and I have been covering health policy for a long time uh, as editors, and we like swim in this alphabet soup of uh, CMS and ACA, and uh, you know, we know all our yes. alphabets. <laughs> and uh, I'm reading about this, and I come across the ADA, which in our world is the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I was like, what does that have to do with these air ambulances? And then, no, it's the Airline Deregulation Act of 1968. So, um, Which is a long time ago. <laughs> it's a long time ago. Uh, the industry was in its inf infancy. But that law basically says states can't put laws on, on top of air carriers. And if air ambulances are air carriers, that means states can't put laws like uh, you can't balance bill uh, or surprise bill patients. Um, you know, insurers are subject to these state laws. Um, also, um, you know, hospitals are subject in mo many states to the certificate of need process that says we have to really look and see if we need a new hospital before we build one. This industry has not been subject to that anywhere because states can't put those laws on them. They can't treat them like a clinic or a hospital. Or right. Which is very interesting that they've been able to maintain that for so long. So my next question, what kind of lobbying presence do they have? They have a pretty good lobbying presence. <laughs> um, the FAA uh, Reauthorization Act just passed uh, in late September. And, and that's more alphabet. Yes. FAA is. Uh, Federal Aviation Administration. Um, and uh, in that bill, in some early versions of that bill, there were uh, provisions that would have said, that would have allowed um, states to regulate air ambulances. Uh, didn't make it into the final uh, uh, bill, which passed uh, in late September. Jackie uh, was a reporter following that for us. Um, so that was, a, that was a victory for the industry. 
But there were some things in that bill, right? You mentioned right. those. Um, there is a, um, there will be a complaint line uh, for people who have these troubles. Um, I'm a little skeptical of that. I think a complaint line is as good as it is advertised, and it's, you know, it remains to be seen whether this will be well advertised. Um, there's also going to be a committee to kind of look into the issues around surprise billing and, uh, and high bills for uh, the industry, and they're supposed to come up with best practices for the industry. So there's some hope for change, but I think uh, people need to communicate with their uh, members of Congress mm -hmm. if they really you know, want to see radical change in this industry. Have, has there been much legislation beyond that one? Bubbling there, up. there is uh, Claire McCaskill, uh, Senator, Democratic Senator Claire McCaskill of Missouri has a bill. Um, she doesn't have any co-sponsors on it right now, but uh, she did have, um, she wrote a letter to the uh, Secretary of Transportation um, that was co-signed by a Republican Senator, uh, Roger Wicker from Mississippi. So uh, I think that uh, lawmakers on both sides of the aisle have heard from uh, their constituents in, in situations like Dr. Khan's. And um, they, there is some, you know, you, you can't read these two dozen stories and not really feel for people who have, are dealing with the stress of a terrible illness or injury and also the stress of a, mm -hmm. you know, $50,000 bill hanging over their heads. So, um, you know, it's important to communicate that to the broader public because, mm -hmm. thank God, not everybody will need an air ambulance. Um, but when you do, it would be nice if it were reasonably priced. And I do remember in, in one of the stories that I read, there are kind of tips. Like if, if this really does happen to you, what, what are you as a patient supposed to do? Well, um, you negotiate, 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 <laughs> um, and uh, you know, do like, as Dr. Khan did, read the fine print of your insurance. Arm yourself with the facts that um, you know we uh, you can find in our story uh, the these facts that you know it's it's twelve thousand dollars per flight. So if you're charging me. $20,000, maybe we can understand that to make up for the, the underpayment in other parts of the industry. If you're charging me $100,000, you know, why? Right. So you, you put yourself in a position to negotiate. Um, and then if you can, if you are in a rural area where you know there's a lot of medical transport, you know, really uh, find out about the companies that are in your network and, and try to make sure um, that you're transported by an in-network company. Right. It's like all of healthcare, the educated consumer is the, the one that fares the best, I guess. Right. Okay. And that, I think, takes care of our questions and our discussion for today. Thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us. Yes, thank you. We'll see you again soon.